From the opinion pages of the Wall Street Journal, this is Potomac Watch. The House is back in Washington with Speaker Mike Johnson apparently determined to pass an aid bill for Ukraine and other American allies around the world, but with a motion to boot him from leadership also hanging over his head. Welcome, I'm Kyle Peterson with the Wall Street Journal. We are joined today by my colleagues, editorial board member Kate batchelder Dell, and columnist Kim Strassel. After what we trust was a relaxing and productive congressional recess, the House is back in D.C. on Tuesday, and the betting seems to be that some kind of Ukraine package will probably get through the House somehow. Uh, but will it be able to make it through the Rules Committee and then pass with just a majority vote? Will it have to be taken up on a suspension of the rules, which requires two-third approval? And what will the bill look like? That all remains to be seen. Meantime, the bill passed by the Senate, which includes about $60 billion for Ukraine, is bottled up in the House. But 190 Democrats and one Republican so far have signed a discharge petition. And if that reaches a majority, it could force a vote on that package. Kate, what's your assessment of the state of play in the House And how do you think the speaker is considering these trade-offs and the kind of legislation that he seems to be floating? Well, before we get into what's going on on the House, I do think it's important to frame a little bit what's going on in Ukraine, because I think it's really influencing what's happening in the House. The Ukrainians are in a precarious position right now. They are holding very fragile lines against the Russians. And the Russian military is making small, about 300 square kilometers by some estimates, progress on the front. And it's coming at a very high cost. They're still taking very large infantry losses. However, there's a lot of evidence that Russia is reconstituting, that they are digging deeper into their stocks of artillery, that they are leaning on North Korea and Iran for more weapons, and that also Russia is quite serious about mounting a spring offensive later this spring or into the summer. And so Ukraine right now does not have what it needs to resist that offensive. And this is, I think, focusing the minds in Washington because the options are You help Ukraine hang on or you own what comes next, which unfortunately could still be a loss for the Ukrainians that is not favorable to the United States. So I think what's going on in the House now is that you have that reality starting to set in, because right now, if the House declines to support further Ukraine aid, President Biden will blame Republicans all the way to November as a political matter for cutting off Ukraine, that he wanted to help our allies, that it was the isolationist Republicans who wouldn't allow him to do so. And I think that would just be an enormous mistake on Republicans' part. Because it wasn't Republicans who decided to give Ukraine only a handful of long-range missiles years into the war. It was the Biden administration that did that foot-dragging. They also spent months debating what kind of tanks that we should give Ukraine. The president's record on Ukraine is weak. And so I think that is part of what's influencing now. You have House Republicans starting to get serious about getting aid to Ukraine through. And what you're going to see here, I think it's still being organized behind the scene. I think you're going to see scenes. But I think you're going to see some package that tries to move mostly lethal assistance to form other types of assistance that maybe go to Ukraine's budget as a loan and then tries to attach some Republican policy victories. We can talk a little bit more about the LNG ban that Republicans are trying to overturn and also possibly try to pay for some of the aid by seizing Russian foreign assets. So that's the contours of I think the larger stakes and how the bill's shaping up in the House. To start with the reality on the ground, Kate mentioned the figure of about 300 square kilometers of territory retaken. One place that is using that number is the Institute for the Study of War. This is from an April 2 assessment of the Russian offensive. It says between January 1 and April 1, 2024, Russian forces have seized approximately 305 square kilometers. ISW continues to assess that material shortages are forcing Ukraine to conserve ammunition and prioritize limited resources to critical sectors of the front. However, increasing the risk of a Russian breakthrough in other less well-provisioned sectors and making the front line overall more fragile than the current relatively slow rate of Russian advances makes it appear. And Kim, I think that may be part of it. Precisely what Kate is saying is that the reality is sinking in in Washington that this could move and this could move relatively quickly. You could have a Russian breakthrough, notably also on April 2nd, President Vladimir Zelensky 
signed a law lowering the age for Ukraine's military mobilization from 27 to 25. And notable in this debate is President Trump's role. He's the presumptive Republican presidential nominee at this point. And at least to my eye, I haven't seen him weigh in and say this aid to Ukraine is a terrible mistake, as you could imagine him doing in some sort of dashed off truth social post. And he has said that he wants to end the war. He has said that within 24 hours, he will get some negotiation to do so. The Washington Post over the weekend had some reporting, said that Trump's proposal consists of pushing Ukraine to cede Crimea and the Donbass border region to Russia, according to people who discussed it with Trump or his advisors and spoke on the condition of anonymity. So we don't know exactly. He hasn't rolled out a precise policy platform. But it seems to me, if you are a Republican in the House, anything that you can do to help Ukraine hold on and reverse those Russian gains, if possible, between now and when you hope that President Trump is going to take office would only strengthen President Trump's hand and Ukraine's hand if President Trump thinks this is going to go to some kind of negotiation. There certainly is a moment happening in Washington. I would argue that it's overdue, but it finally came about because Congress was able belatedly to get done with its funding problem for 2024. And Kate laid out very well the difficulties that the Ukrainian side is facing and the huge risks that would come if we do not act and move. But I think it's also important to recognize just in terms of the ground that folks in Washington also understand that on the flip side, there's potentially an opportunity as well. It's both sides of the same coin in that Russia has also had a rough couple of years. If you go back to December, our intelligence agencies estimated that they had lost 315,000 troops so far, and it's now two-year engagement. Last year, Russia itself had to raise its conscription age to 30 from 27 to try to replace those big losses. There was a recent estimate that they have lost about $55 billion worth of equipment which to put in context as half of this year's defense budget for Russia. So, I mean, that's an extraordinary number. They have more wherewithal, especially because they've had ongoing industrial and commercial support from backers like China. And so if we've already invested what we have in this, that is the stakes that we're talking about is, are we going to just allow this to falter into attrition? Or are we going to seize this moment? And that gets to Donald Trump. I think that already some people have made the argument that if he really is serious about his argument that if he were president, he could solve this in a short period of time, get everyone at the negotiating table. If that's the case, his hand is going to be infinitely more strengthened to do that. If Ukraine is back on the offense and has made some gains before the election. So it's been very notable that Trump has not come out to oppose the Repo Act, which is what Mike Johnson is now putting forward. This notion of loans and this notion, too, of seizing some of Russia's sovereign assets to help pay for some of this. He's giving people a window. And I think that that's also been aided by a number of pro-Ukrainian Russians who continue to have good ties with Donald Trump, who have been calling him and making the case that this needs to get through. So you definitely feel something has shifted and that there is a possibility. The risk on the other side is that those who oppose this aid have been digging in even further. And I think the risk not is just that they threaten Mike Johnson and his speakership over it, but that they somehow convinced Donald Trump to come out and also put his finger on the scale here, which could make an already difficult situation harder. Hang tight. We'll be right back in a moment. Welcome back. What about President Biden's role in all of this? Where is his leadership, both in terms of getting the public on board with this idea, building public pressure to not abandon an ally like Ukraine, as well as other allies around the world, including Israel and Taiwan? And where is his effort to convince some of these Republicans in the House to go along, convince enough Democrats in the House to go along to get this over the finish line, especially if it needs that two thirds hurdle under a suspension of the rules. And Kate, and to that point, if Republicans 
put some things in this bill as policy that they want, that they think will rally more Republican members to this legislation, something overruling that pause the Biden administration has put in place on liquefied natural gas facilities, export facilities. Do you think that President Biden would sign that if that legislation got to his desk? Well, the details on that have been evolving, and there is some concern that the details of the specific LNG pause that is under discussion uh, would be quite limited and not have the large effect on new projects that its proponents of overturning the ban would want. So we'll have to see the details on that, because if it is a fig leaf that Biden can sign, that's less of a victory for Republicans. But I do think that President Biden, first of all, has an obligation to make the public case for the Ukraine and Israel and Taiwan money that he's seeking, and that he has struggled to do that. However, at the State of the Union, he framed what's going on in the world as an inflection point on par with the late 1930s. That's a pretty heavy historical analogy. And so then to basically be unwilling to convince Democrats to vote for the bill or to go around what the uh, climate lobby wants in an election year in an LNG ban, I think would show some political cynicism on the president's part if he declined to really urge his colleagues to vote for the bill. So I do think you need more of a role of persuasion from the president. And there has been this public attitude as though Mike Johnson is the commander in chief, and he's not. That said, I think Johnson is smart to try to come up with something that can get as much of his conference as possible. The high watermark for Republicans opposing Ukraine aid is about 100, roughly half the conference. But that vote was a while ago, and there's reason to think that it was venting accumulated frustrations that Republicans have. The president's dithering in particular weapon types and the lack of a larger strategy or thinking that the president really hasn't articulated. So I do think there is a possibility that more Republicans are persuadable on a Ukraine package that does address some of those issues, that gets them a discrete policy victory on energy, where Republicans tend to be in pretty broad agreement, one area of policy where there isn't much disagreement. So I think that could help Johnson get much closer to more than half of his conference, which would be important for him if he would like to stay in power. The more Republicans that he can get on board with this, the stronger the vote is and the more likely I think he is to survive. But I think it makes him look like a leader, which is what the party wants to be trying to move this package at all, to be saying out there, as Johnson did, we will do our job. I think that it is a good bent for him to be taking to survive the rest of the year, no matter these critics that are threatening his hold on power. The LNG pause is an interesting case, though, because, Kim, my read of that is that President Biden was pushed into doing that because he is trying to make sure that the climate left is excited and ready to go out and vote to reelect Joe Biden in November. But I think it's bad policy from an economic standpoint. We should want these jobs in the United States, drilling for natural gas here. From a climate standpoint, natural gas, if it can displace coal and other sorts of fuels, it can help actually lower emissions. That's how the U.S. over the last several years has drastically cut its emissions. And from a national security standpoint, we had lots of Europe worried about cold winters in the past couple of years after the Russian invasion of Ukraine. And why should the U.S. not be sending our natural gas resources over to those allies in Europe to keep them warm? I think that it's good policy to continue this. So, frankly, I wonder if from a political standpoint, Joe Biden would maybe benefit from losing this battle with Republicans and he can sign the bill and say to the climate left, look, I tried, but we needed to get this aid to our allies in Ukraine and Israel and Taiwan. And then he doesn't have to go into the election weighed down by the bad policy and the bad politics of this LNG pause. Yeah, of course he would. And by the way, this has been something that Republicans really need to amp up, which is the national security aspects of this. It's not just about keeping our allies warm, but of course, the reason that they have needed that additional LNG that we have helped to provide is because Vladimir Putin has threatened to cut off and in fact, indeed, has slowed deliveries to Western Europe. And that only makes Western Europe even more susceptible to his demands, more reluctant to really go after him and his terrible policies because they're held hostage to their energy problems. So this has been 
a vital aspect of the larger Ukraine war effort. And it makes zero sense for the administration to be coming to Congress and saying we need to do more for Ukraine, which we absolutely do, while simultaneously supporting an LNG export ban uh, that is so detrimental to our allies that are also supporting and helping Ukraine as well, too all for a climate objective, which is unrealistic. I mean, let me also point that out. This isn't going to make one bit of difference to global warming. It is a completely token move. And that's the problem. As with so much that's been going on in this White House, their only interest at the moment, it would seem, leading up to the election is about re-engaging different portions of its base, its activist base. And there are a lot in the climate lobby that remain unhappy with the president because, for instance, he he greenlighted the Willow drilling project in Alaska. He hasn't done enough here or there. You know, they wanted a complete end to fossil fuels, as unrealistic and silly as that is. So this is catnip to his climate crowd. It's undermining his own goals in Ukraine. But it's remarkable to me that he is actually willing, it would seem. Is he really going to refuse to sign a bill that has an LNG export provision in it? that also has the Ukraine funding he wants. I mean, that would be remarkable. And it's why Republicans should feel very confident about putting this in and getting that victory.